everybody for coming. You made it last session and you saved the best session to end with, right? I mean, that, that's Absolutely. correct, I'm not wrong, right? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, my name is Tom Wojciechowski, I'm part of the Elements Conference here. This is Jason and Georgie, they're gonna be presenting on a strategic approach dynamic web content personalization, it's real easy to say. So let's give them our undivided attention, make sure you have your computers muted and your cell phones on vibrate, and also please at the end of the session, please remember to fill out the evaluations. Critically important is how we evaluate the presenters is how they find out how well they've done with their presentation, okay? And then if we have questions at the end, wait for me to get this to you so that way it will be captured on the stream so people watch you can hear the question that you're asking. All right, thank you. Take it away, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. How are you all doing? Good. How's right. the conference been? Good. 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 Great. Oh, good. Clapping. Excellent. I like starting with clapping. Uh, Georgie and I are here to talk to you a little bit today about uh, personalization in real time and how to develop a content strategy and show you how, um, how we've implemented some of that for some of our clients and how it's working and what you can expect as you're going forward. So to give you a little intro, I'm Jason Smith. I'm one of the managing directors at OHO Interactive and we're an agency in Boston. We've been around about 17 years. Uh, we've worked in higher ed for about the last eight doing strategy, design, full website overhauls, um, thinking about integrations uh, between different systems um, as well as how we can map the kind of customer student journey as we go forward. And I'm Georgie Cohen. I'm the Associate Creative Director for Digital Strategy at OHO. I've been there for two years. I've been working in or with higher ed since 2004. A variety of consulting and in-house engagements trying to make sense of content on the .edu, which is lots of fun. And the kinds of projects that we work on a lot of times is we uh, describe our projects as fixing big website messes. So oftentimes it's how our clients feel emotionally. When they come to us, they say, hey, my website feels like this garage and we help them pull everything out on the driveway and figure out what stays on the curb and what stuff goes back into the garage on nice new shelves. So uh, we do all the stuff you would expect from an agency in terms of strategy, wireframes, design, technology, builds, but we really focus a lot more on user research, so understanding what users are really interested in. So we do a lot of testing, a lot of talking to folks over the last number of years. We've talked to hundreds of students and surveyed thousands of them in all sorts of different um, areas. So some are undergrads, graduates, continuing learners, nursing students, art students, how do they all act differently? And we map all that in a customer journey to really understand how do they move through the website. So the website is not like one thing that they use one way in September and another way in May. It is a thing that changes as they move forward. So we really want to make sure that we map that whole journey. And then real-time personalization, which we'll be talking about today. So before we get started, we have a few questions for you. So you're going to want to put down your pens. You're going to roll your chairs back just a little bit because we're going to ask you to stand up. As, wait, wait, as you stay seated now. <laughs> when we ask the question, we're gonna ask you to stand up. Okay, are you ready? Georgie's gonna go. So who here really does not have a sense of what personalization is? Kind of unclear on what, what that really means. If you don't understand, stand up now. Oh. All right. Who here has a pretty strong understanding? They understand what website personalization is all about. They know the concept, they're very familiar with it. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Good, good. All so right, people okay. who maybe have a, they, they kind of think they know, kind of sure, we're in the middle, you know, in between, I guess, if it's everybody else. Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, who here is actually, okay, so who here, y'all can sit down. <laughs> who here has actually implemented some kind of personalized experience or campaign or, or, or component on, on your, or what, your website or through an email or some other way? Now you all going to come give the presentation with us? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, who here thinks that personalization, they're a little bit skeptical about the whole concept. It seems a little bit creepy or weird or a little bit, little bit off. Not really sure about, about it. No. Yeah. One. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> awesome. Great. So what we've done already is learn a lot about you. Just asking a few questions. Our goal in that was to understand our audience and know what, what are your motivations for being here uh, and what content could we provide you through this presentation that will help you un understand um, and, and make this a better experience. Uh, so just by asking those few questions, we have learned a lot about you, our audience. We've done our user research. Now, you know, we, with that information, we could craft content to serve to you uh, through this experience that would really help you, help you answer those questions, be relevant to you, uh, you know, if everyone here was an expert, you know, we, we would want to give expert level content and that kind of thing. Um, if everyone here was like totally like had no clue, it'd be very, very introdu introductory and fundamental. So just by asking those questions, we've learned a lot and can deliver a more personalized experience to you in this session. So this is the same thing that happens on your website. So 
you all, we knew we're interested in personalization because you're in this room, right? Just like prospective undergraduates, we know what they are because they got here, but we don't know anything about them when we started. As Georgie said, by asking a few questions, we now have a sense of really what's going on in this room with very little additional information, we were able to do that. The same thing is what we're able to do now on the web with personalization. With small amounts of personalization, small amounts of knowledge, we're able to change the experience that people are having that's gonna better suit them and have them a better experience overall, which is gonna lead to more conversions and more engagement as we go forward. So we're already kind of familiar with personalized experiences. This is one such uh, email I got recently from CVS. I'm a big fan of the extra bucks. They're, they're awesome. Um, I bought some body wash. I used my little extra care card. CVS is all over that. I get this email that's all like, here's a 30% coupon on beauty products. Would you like these other shampoos or fragrance-free lotions or other kind of moisturizing products? So they're picking up on my interest on buying the body wash delivering me a discount so I can buy more of that kind of product, the beauty product, and then serving me some content because obviously I need all of these, these products. They obviously don't understand that my regimen is pretty, pretty basic, but you know, they're, they're giving me some opportunities and they're, they're playing off of that, that piece of information that they have about me. And then next we can look at um, my Amazon homepage and they know, everyone can tell I've been searching for toddler shoes. Because <laughs> obviously I have a three year old, I'm buying shoes every other week. Um, so here we are, here's my browsing, based on my browsing history, additional items to explore, recommendations for you in shoes. Uh, so they're really playing off of this. Um, and then there's the next page as well, where there's some more personalization that they have delivered here. So my shopping trends, children's books, Pete the Cat, big fans of Pete the Cat in my house. Kitchen and dining, no, I don't cook, but I do buy the pots and pans that my husband uses to cook. <laughs> and here are some movies to watch for a night in because Amazon knows I have no life. <laughs> so, they got me, they know me, they're serving me content that is based on my purchasing and browsing history that they know or they presume will be really relevant to me. And generally they're correct. And so the impact of personalization is real. It's more than this sort of like fun and kitschy and look at that, I was looking for shoes and here are shoes, isn't that interesting? It's driving real revenue. So drawing some, some statistics from sort of the corporate um, and the e-commerce world, 35% uh, of Amazon's revenue is generated by its recommendation engine. Now, that's a stat from a little while ago, um, almost a decade ago. But and it's funny that, that we we looked around like, oh, there's got to be more recent stats. But you got to feel that Amazon's probably clammed up on that kind of stuff recently. But think about the context of how much the technology has improved in that time. It's still got to be in that ballpark. A significant amount of their revenue is driven by those same recommendations. I'm going to look at those toddler shoes and be like, oh, are these shoes I didn't see when I was looking before? Are there some deals? Like, and I'm going to go and I'm going to look at that content and perhaps make a purchase because Amazon has presented that to me. 75% of users select movies based on Netflix's recommendations. That's, that's, from, that's a stat from a couple of years ago. So when Netflix is looking at your viewing history and the movies that you've added to your watch list, the movies that you've watched, they're then delivering more recommend recommendations to you. They know that you love horror movies or you love 80s or you love romantic comedies or whatnot. So they're gonna pull out more movies from their archives and show them to you and present them to you in the hopes that you will then add them to your watch list and keep watching Netflix. That's, they, that's what they want you to keep doing. So by dr drawing from your data, they can then g give you opportunities to, to do that very thing. And 61% of consumers actually feel better about a company that delivers custom content. Uh, that's uh, from a demandmetric.com, uh, some stats that they presented. So when you see content that is personalized, the research shows that people, it actually gives them a positive feeling because it's some sense that that entity, that company, that organization knows them, understands them, and is providing something relevant. Uh, if we start talking to you about something that's entirely relevant, irrelevant to your work, to what you're sitting in this room for, you're going to walk out, you're going to leave because you're like, this is not a relevant experience. The more relevant we make this to your interests, the more satisfied you're going to be, the more positive you're going to feel, the more engaged that you will be. And that's what the stats show for personalized web experiences. But despite that, I think the number one objection people tend to say is that it's creepy for folks. So they don't like the experience, right? Um, and, and so, you know, Starbucks, I would say, I think a, a big challenge to that is, right, so I go to Starbucks, I go to the same Starbucks every morning, mostly, uh, except that I found that new coffee shop across the street, which is trendy and cool. So I have been skipping my Starbucks, despite my points. But I show up at the Starbucks, and they, after a year, start to know me a little bit, right? And so I'm not creeped out when the guy says, would you like the coffee, the dark roast that you get every morning, because we have that context. Now, if I run into that guy, like, on the subway or at the beach, and they come up and says, hey, do you want the dark roast, or it's dark roast guy, 
that's <laughs> creepy, right? Like, because we don't have the context, right? And so a lot of it is really just creepy is understanding the context of what's going on, right? And so a number of people agree with this. So from uh, this is from Accenture, 86% people said that they were a little wary about being tracked in terms of their data. So I think, you know, we're not alone in having that feeling. Sadly, also, 85% realized that, eh, that would probably give me a better experience as well. So we're pretty ambivalent about that experience, right? We're a little worried, but we're also um, understanding that we can get a better experience as we're seeing from Netflix and from Amazon as we go forward. So I think part of what's important is as the creep factor is always thinking about the context. What is the context in which you're trying to personalize content and hand things to folks? If, it's, if you're out of context, it is creepy and weird. Um, but if you're using that sort of for the better good or for helping someone forward, people don't have those same sort of triggers. And the second objection, this kind of goes into the, the publisher perspective, is that it takes too much content. Because you know, if you think about a personalized experience, like if it's me and you're trying to give me sort of a personalized experience via your website, suddenly it's all about like this one user, what do they need, and all, all this information I need because I have this motivation, this goal, and I'm looking for this information. And there are thousands of other me's out there, and quickly it can just seem overwhelming. Is how am I supposed to personalize the experience for all these thousands of site visitors we have every day? That's unmanageable, it's unsustainable. How can I possibly do this? Uh, it's really overwhelming. Um, but really, I mean, real-time personalization is the natural extension of what we're already doing. We are already trying to think about and publishing for our audience. We are already creating content that we want to be relevant, that we want to drive certain actions. This is work that we're already doing. Uh, and when we sort of add a layer of real-time personalization to that, we're just able to do that a little more effectively, a little more efficiently, and taking the, the content that we already have and target it to a defined um, track of, of a t of type of individual that we're looking to provide a customized, personalized experience to. Think back to the Amazon example, for instance. Amazon isn't going to go, oh my god, Georgie was looking for shoes. We had to create more shoes. Quick, let's design more shoes. Let's go totally create more shoes. T t call the factory. We're going to turn out more shoes because she's looking for them. Amazon already has shoes. It's all already there. All that they're doing, based on looking at my data of where I'm going, what I'm searching for, is giving me a clear, more direct connection to those shoes. They're surfacing them right here so I don't have to go looking for them. And that's what we can do by having a layer of personalization, is take the information that we already have on our website, that we've already sort of thoughtfully created and organized, and just more directly and, and at, the right, at the right time, deliver that information, that content, to a particular individual. So as we take a look at that, we're thinking about that process, as Georgie said, is it the process we're already doing? We're already thinking, hey, we want our website to do something. We have a goal. We want people to come visit campus. We want them to apply. We want them to request info. We're trying to understand, well, what would be motivating them? What would get them to campus? How can we talk about that? How can we define sort of what the journey is and the pathway? What steps, what do they need to do before they would come visit campus? How do we structure our websites around that? So we, as Georgie said, we already think about the sort of information architecture of our website, and we try and think about it, what the user wants uh, as we move forward, not just how our institution thinks about it. We want to think about, well, how does a user think about organizing this content? And then how do we design a page that bubbles up the content that's most relevant at the top or on the side or at the point of need? Um, and then how do we move that, that content along as people move through the journey? How do we make sure that they're getting the content? So as, you, as Georgie said, hey, we're already moving through this process. Some of the things we're already trying to do are the best practices that we're trying to put in place as we redesign sites. Personalization is just an extension of adding that, of saying, well, we know one more thing. We know a level of data, and we can sort of intuit where you are in that customer journey and take that content that we already wrote for you and we already know is important to you and show it to you at the moment when you actually need it. So what it really does is it adds another layer of expertise, like Jason said. So think about, um, you know, we all start by sort of this domain expertise. Like, I work in higher ed. I know about the web. I have 10 years of experience. I'm very smart. I'm knowledgeable. I understand the space. I, I, I have no best practice. So then the next level is understanding your audience. We can do user research. We can say, this is what prospective students want. This is what prospective adult learners want. This is what their parents want. This is what, um, adult, uh, this is what alumni want. And we can generally understand the audience through user research. Then the next layer, analytics and user testing, refines it even more. When I can understand the user in aggregate in terms of their behavior. Here's what they're actually doing. Here's how they're using the site. Here's generally where they're going, what's, what, what's working for them, what's not. 
then it goes from understanding the user in aggregate to understanding individual users and being able to understand, hey, there's this individual, and this is the path that they're taking through the site, and they're moving towards this goal. So we can sort of apply, you know, see what their journey is, and then help them along the way. Um, through, and then that's what personalization allows us to do, uh, is through that layer we can then uh, sort of guide that experience with more relevant information. So we're going to talk a little bit about the approach uh, to really help make this truly effective. And it's really a one-two punch of user research and content strategy. Um, because it's not just sort of like willy-nilly, like let's like look at people and just throw things at them and, and hope that that's going to help them. It's more about by really truly understanding our audience through research and then taking a content strategy approach to how we're organizing and planning the content that we deliver through a personalized experience. That's how we can really make personalization effective and driving the results that we want it to, to help us achieve. So for instance, if you're going to undertake user research, and that can entail focus groups, some online interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews, different tactics that you can use for user research, you have to go into your research with goals. What is it that you're trying to understand about your audience? So for one client, um, you know, things we're looking to understand were, how are students finding or picking a school? What is their motivation for returning to school? So if these are adult learners looking to sort of go back and continue their studies, why are they doing this? Uh, perceptions of the school and its peers. What are, what are their sort of impressions of this school and, and other schools like it? Um, how different audiences are viewing different educational structures and defining messaging and language. So getting a sense of what messaging and language resonates and what doesn't with this particular audience. And then we really want to sort of determine what the customer journey is. So through all this research, we're going to understand what is their path? Where are they going? Where do they start? Uh, what are sort of the different paths along the way? Where do they end up? So in this instance, it's sort of the, what is their pre-existing condition? What's prompting them to even want to go back to, and, and pursue their studies in the first place? Uh, the identification of the need, sort of the recommendations they get along the way. Is it from family? Is it from employers? Is it from friends? Who's sort of influencing that journey? Then they sort of explore options and how they're going about doing research and looking at different options available to them. Then they matriculate, and then they disengage. So with this, you know, th this particular customer journey, they don't sort of continue on necessarily to a strong alumni relationship. It's more sort of the disengagement, moving on with their professional path, um, and having success in that way. But once we've identified this customer journey, then you sort of know where they are and what's influencing them at each step along the way. And that gives you a lot of information to know, OK, at, this, at these different points, I know what they're looking for, and I have information that can help them, that can further their understanding to help them uh, uh, pursue uh, the information they're looking for. Then there's the development of personas. So when we think about a persona, it really combines a few different things. Uh, one is a segment. Uh, and it can be challenging to market by individual segments. If you're trying just to target um, you know, each one, there's a lot of them. Uh, and then you have different roles. Um, and it, it could be alumni, percent of student, et cetera. But if you're trying to organize your website by role, that can be very challenging to maintain. Then you can apply a scenario. Uh, which gives you sort of a real world use case that can help sort of prioritize those segments. If you combine all of those three and then add the layer of sort of those behaviors and motivations. So what are their demographics? What are their behaviors? Really understanding who they are as people, what's really motivating them, those characteristics. All these factors combined help you create personas that you can then use and say, okay, these are the people. We have a firmer sense of who those users are because we've identified the types of users that we have. Uh, and then once you identify the personas, then you can have a sense of, okay, who am I going to be um, targeting content to? And that's very helpful to sort of focus your efforts. So a persona has different characteristics. Obviously, there's the demographics that they have. Their entree, so how are they learning about uh, your school? How are they learning about the organization? The influencers along the way, like we talked about, employers, family, peers, et cetera. Their pain points, what are the struggles that they're having? Uh, what are the sort of the, the challenges that they have along the way that we can perhaps help mitigate? Then there's the marketing strategy. So some sense of what is, how, what's an effective way to communicate with them? Are they, are they really involved on social media or not? Um, do they like to sort of you know, read, you know, they want to know process and steps, or they want to know, read stories? You know, some sense of how, what's an effective way of communicating to this particular type of individual. So this is sort of the textbook. That we're going to move into the content strategy part now. We sort of have our sense of who our people are. We understand the user. We've done our research. We have our personas established. We know the segments in place. And now we're going to think about the content strategy piece. This is the textbook definition of content strategy by Christina Halverson, that content strategy is planning for the creation, delivery, and governance of useful, usable content. 
So when you think about this and you think about personalization, at least, at least I see a lot of alignment here because that's what we're trying to do through a personalized web experience. We're trying to deliver useful, usable content that's going to influence and guide and help the user at certain points of action, at certain places along that journey by us understanding them and knowing who they are and what they're looking for, what's going to be helpful to them. Um, we can then provide them that useful, usable content. But it's not going to work just sort of in a buckshot, scattershot approach. There has to be a thoughtful planning around how we're creating, delivering, and managing that content. So it's very important to take a content strategy approach to thinking about personalized content. So you're making the most of all that research work that you've done to really understand your user so that of all the information that you have and that you can create to help influence and, and, and guide that individual, that you're doing it in a really thoughtful way. So we're going to talk about an uh, ex actual example. So we uh, did some work for a school in Rhode Island. And the persona, just to give you a description, we went out and did research. We talked to uh, like 80 different people. We developed a persona for them. You don't have to do 80. We just, that's just what we did. Um, so we um, came with a persona. It's an adult learning community. So these are folks that are degree completers. They left school for some reason, didn't finish their degree, um, or they want to come back. They have a certificate that they want to advance. They have an associate's degree that they want to move forward with. So uh, we did some research. The persona of this person is they are very tactical. They do not want any kind of emotion connection to the school. Um, they don't, in the sense of like, they don't like the campus shots. They don't want to see people hanging out on the quad. That's not their thing. They're going to come to school at night. They want to get the degree done, and they want to do it either for personal achievement or their goal is to actually be um, kind of move forward in their career. So they want the career advancement. So in a really crass way, the degree is a speed bump to their future career that they're really looking forward. And they, they didn't have a great experience the first time, and they want to move through that process. So to Georgie's point, we, we defined that persona. And then we first came up with a visual design for what that looked like. And this is the design for their homepage. So we meet you where you are, your goal, our purpose. right? So they wanted really direct language. We tested a ton of different photos. This photo actually tested the best, this kind of photography. So nighttime shots were actually helpful. Something that was urban, it's in the city. Um, they, liked, uh, they didn't like seeing a lot of kind of people in the shot that way. They actually liked things that were totally abstract as a background. So the first image was really important. They do really like seeing someone in the job that they're in, but they have 16 different degrees in totally different career fields, so we can't show that. So the next thing, uh, find your program was the first activity, right? So we asked them for their priorities. If you click that, it opens up a box. You can find your program right there. The most transfer credits, the number, number two concern from a content management uh, or a content strategy was that they wanted to know, how am I going to pay for this? The fact that they would offer a lot of credit for either their actual schooling or the work that they had done was important. So we're, we're, again, we're prioritizing those messages. Um, and then the four key messages, life experience, Classes anytime, anywhere. Military is about half of their audience. And then covering the cost, right? So we're hitting the main thing. So we, we've, we understand who the persona is. We understand what resonates with them. We understand what messages are important to them. And then um, we did not pick some picture of this hipster guy. He's not, I would say, the best photo for this shot. Um, but the next thing is sort of getting people into finding their program. So we've taken right, the best practices. We figured out, like, we've done the user research. We developed the persona. We structured the page that we want. The next thing we started to do was thinking about, well, great, how can we add personalization? We're going to take a little bit of step backwards and start you at the beginning of how we thought about that. So the way we thought about personalization is, great, we can, what if we could start changing some of that content on the website to start influencing people? And the places we wanted to influence were the prospects way at the top at the suspect. So these are people, because what they got well, a lot of people who were just starting to think about school, how could we get them to inquire and engage? Because they're really, really good once they got them in person and started talking to them. So how could we get their get them to reach out, and then how can we get those inquiries to turn into applicants? Now, traditionally, where people have problems, if, if they're having trouble with their funnel, they start dumping more names up at the top, or they start changing their standards, right? So they start lowering their standards for admission and accepting anybody to see who they can get through. Or they start either, if it's an undergrad funnel, buying more names or paying more for pay for click at the top. Our whole approach was to say, how can we influence the people that are coming in who are already on the website? And so we think about personalization as basically running a campaign on your website. So the same way you would run a pay-per-click campaign, where you pick your targets and your keywords, and you write your copy, and you send them to a landing page. We do the same thing. We pick our segment. We know what folks they want. We figure out how to send them content, and then we get them to connect through. So what we have is a, the home page, and we have a personalization sort of engine that's running underneath. And so it's collecting data. So as soon as someone starts coming, before they've even given us a name, we start getting their data and start tracking them. And we take that data, and we've done two different things with it. 
One is for an anonymous user, we're starting to do real-time personalization. So it will actually change in the same visit. We'll start changing the content that people are seeing as they're coming through. So people start building up a, a, some information about sort of who they are and what they're interested in. And we picked three audiences to start with. We picked military, because it's about half of the folks. We picked their EMS program, and we picked their paralegal program. Because when we started looking at where people were going on the website, these were the top areas that people were looking. It actually was surprisingly not hard to figure out what people were looking at. We also did not see people doing a lot of cross comparison between programs. So you didn't have people like, hey, I'm looking at the EMS program, and I'm looking at the underwater basket weaving, and I'm looking at the pottery class. You didn't see any of that. They looked at one thing, right? The only place we saw some confusion was around healthcare, because they have a couple programs that are named kind of the same thing. And so people were doing some back and forth. You could watch them do it. So personalization, so the first thing. So they come, as soon as they start coming, we start collecting information about what they're interested in and start to try and figure out, can we put them into a segment? Then what can we do with that? So this, again, was the home page, right? So we had this, hipster guy, high quality, convenient academic programs for you. We had some additional information. Not the right images, we didn't pick them. So if you click the paralegal program, you come back to the home page, this is the image that you see. We change the image immediately. It says, we meet you where you are because that headline tested well. Achieve your goal, become a paralegal. We change the language down here. The most transfer and life credits for paralegal studies. And then the call to action, rather than going to look at all your programs, changes immediately. We change the image to a law image, which triggers for people what it is. Five high quality, convenient paralegal programs. We take them to the page where they're able to compare those different programs. So we're being helpful because most of these people are coming back a second time. So by the time they hit the homepage, they've come back. We're basically putting a bookmark where they left off, right? What would they do otherwise? They're gonna go to your name navigation, they're gonna go back to the programs, so they're gonna go and try and find paralegal again. So is it creepy? No, because the images changed on the homepage anyway, so they don't know that we're personalizing that to them. It's just a nice moment. Also, we're changing elements here and being helpful to them to actually take them to the place that we're seeing as the next action. Same thing happens with the military family. So one of the par parts that came out of the research was that military is not just the veteran, it's actually the family. And a number of the people that were actually taking advantage of the benefits were the family overall. We picked Navy because half of their folks, the Navy is a big uh, group of what they work with. But we wanted to reemphasize that. So if you've gone down, you'll see militaries in the main navigation. There's a number of pages. They do a fantastic job about like educating folks about what their benefits are as a military, helping them through the paperwork process. Um, so we want to actually draw those people back in. So get some, again, emphasis here on the home page. Um, as we scroll down, it changes uh, meet us on base or online. So we take them over to that. We change the images. We talk about it being convenient online and for both of those families. We're being able to move forward. So again, these things are happening in real time as people are going through. Um, you're not, we're not creating separate pages for them. It's just based on the segment, sort of automatically being able to swap those out. So the other thing that we're able to do is once someone gives us their name, so that means either if someone, if we sent out an email to folks, if we bought a list and emailed it, we know their name when they come in or if they fill out one of the request info forms or take any action where we get that, we start to have a list of folks that are on this site. So we actually know who they are and we can start um, helping the admissions people understand what's happening. So this is what a user starts to look like. You can see the user, you can see all the visits, how many visits they come back, what times they've been engaged, and we can actually show them every page that's looking. So what we've done with this is we actually have a hot list that we give to the admissions team to say, hey, here are a bunch of people, they filled out inquiry forms, but you don't know anything else, right? You sent them an email and they didn't respond. We can actually tell the admissions team, hey, are people engaged on the website? What is going on with these folks? And so you can figure out as an admissions team, how should we reach out? Should we call them? Should we email them? I see they're looking at financial aid. Maybe we should call and not say, hey, I hear you're looking at financial aid. No context, that's creepy, right? You wanna call and get the person who's best about explaining financial aid on the phone and ask a bunch of questions, just follow up, and then say, you know, any questions about the application process of financial aid, work it into the conversation. So the results so far is that, um, we had, in, in 90 days, we were able to get 281 named people on the site that we can actually track and show what's going on on the site so that we can hand those things over to the admissions folks to figure out. What we've been seeing is also engagement rates 29% higher uh, than non-personalized. So we're seeing people spend a lot more time, which I think you're seeing average visit times globally are four minutes for the site. For folks that are getting a personalized experience in those profiles, it's in those segments, it's 41 minutes in terms of their engagement. So they're having a lot, lot more engagement. We have not gotten them to convert yet. <laughs> so one of the things we learned is it's really small. When we start slicing segments, we realize it takes a long time. Um, we're, we've gotten 
maybe 250 people through the, our segment lists over the course of three weeks. So we're just not getting a lot of volume. And so I think one of the challenges is getting more people to kind of pull through. The other thing is we're actually adding some other other um, mechanisms to get people to click more so that they're able to click. There's not enough action buttons on the homepage we designed, we realized. So we need to actually add more so we can get people to engage and come through to the different elements. But we're able to see, being able to significantly increase the stickiness of people on the website, the engagement with the content, longer visit times overall. So four kind of insights and sort of a little summary here, and then George is gonna talk a little bit about how you can apply that to strategy. So a few things that we learned. One is that this kind of principle, the way we talk about it, is that people are kind of leaving digital footprints all over your website, right? And this process has actually given us a way to kind of look at those footprints and understand really what are people doing on that site and bubble that up in a unique way. So just in the way that you think about expressed intent maybe in some of your organizations where you think, hey, this student is really interested in our school because they had an alumni interview, they visited campus twice, they came to an accepted student's day, uh, they've sent three emails. Like that person, like you're capturing that information. In the same way, we can start capturing that information as people just wander all over your website. They leave little footprints about what they're interested in, and we now have a way to kind of, a mechanism to capture and, tra and track that. Um, we can also take your, this picture does not display well up there. We can also turn your website basically into a window into your funnel. So we're able to, just like a focus group, kind of watch what your, what your customers are doing on the website, right? So we're able to see that action. So we're able to look through the window and figure out like, well, what are those footprints? Where are people working? One of the things we're seeing here is what programs are popular and not popular, right? You could, you could do that with Google Analytics already. But we're able to see it here and seeing how are people really engaging with that? Are they moving forward? So being able to kind of turn your website into a funnel where you're actually able to get more information and have expressed intent is important. One of the challenges is we talk to admissions people is there's this kind of feeling of like, hey, what's going on on the other side? Like we sent out emails, we had things happen. We can only really see people when they move the funnel from you know, inquired to accepted as they move forward, we're not able to actually see what happens, what's, what's going on. So if you get three applicants, or three, and they've never been in your CRM system and you don't know anything about them, they might all look the same to you right now. But, but with this, we can actually start to figure out, well, that one has never been to your website, the other one's been here three times, the other one's been here 12 times. So those three sort of stealth applicants are actually helping us to start understand that they can be really different. Uh, we can have a lot more visibility and sort of tear down some of the kind of barriers that we have. Uh, I was talking to a college president recently, and he said, what terrifies me the most? The 80 stealth accepts who can make or break our year. So these are folks that they accept who have not been to campus, they don't know a ton about, but these folks represent a million dollars to this school, which is the difference between whether they're gonna have a great year or whether they're just gonna be scraping by and cutting budgets, right? And so what scares him the most is that experience, right? And say, well, we can actually tell you whether any of those are active, right? We can give you real-time intelligence, and I think part of the challenge is that will start changing how we have to work together with admissions as marketing people. We have to say, great, we can tell you new stuff. Now we need to figure out in real time, we have 30 days to get these kids in on how do we engage them? What's the best way? Should we call? Should we email? Should we be um, reaching out in other ways? So figuring out this information can actually hopefully help this president sleep a little better at night. Um, and, the, and the last sort of insight that we had is that by doing actually data analysis, we're capturing all this data about users using the site, this crazy amounts of information coming in, what we can start to see um, is actually figure out where are there new segments, where are there things available. So during World War II, one of the challenges the Allies had was that their planes were being shot down. So big bombers going over to Germany, getting shot down and coming back. And so the, uh, they said, well, we're gonna put, we can put more armor on, but armor is a, is a finite resource. Like we can only put a little bit because we put too much. The planes are not gonna be able to maneuver. They won't be able to fly at all. And so we need to figure out where the best place to put it. So the analytics guy said, hey, no problem, we'll analyze the problem. So they took all the planes, they looked at all, all the bullet holes were, figured out where they were, they came back and they said, we've got the answer for you. The armor, definitely, wings and fuselage, best place for the armor. And they said, uh, the mathematicians looked at it and they said, uh, we disagree. And they said, oh, no, no, we did all the mapping, we, we tracked all the data, we took a look at every plane, we took, mapped every bullet hole, here's the overlay of everything. And, the, and they said, the mathematician said, no, you're looking at the wrong set of data. You have to be looking at the airplanes that did not come back, the ones that are on the ground. The place you should put it is the engine, because apparently you can be shot in the, in the fuselage or the wings and still make it back. You can't be shot in the engine. So you, if they were able to look at the planes that had crashed, they would have come up with the right answer. In the same way, 
I think these airplanes that have crashed are sort of like your stealth students these days. And, and they're the ones that you have no information about. They're not the ones you're necessarily marketing to. They're not the ones that you're looking for. But they are like black. You, know, you can't tell what's going on in them. They're just dark, right? So if we could actually analyze what's going on, then we'd actually be able to figure out, well, how do we market to them? Who is that segment? What is that segment that's emerging? Now we actually have the opportunity because we have data about them. So as I said, you can have people that look like stealth applicants, look like people that you don't know at all, but suddenly you have this sort of footprint history of what they've done across all your digital properties, and you can start to see what are they doing, what is interesting about them, how can they be a new segment. So you take all this data that you collect from a kind of individual user basis mm -hmm. and do data analysis on that and start to find new segments that you can then market to. All right, I'll grab. The remote here. So go. now I'm going to talk about like, we're talking about delivering content through a personalized experience. But how are we going to wrangle that content, right? How are we going to do that? So, content mapping and content planning are really are going to be your your plan for success here. Like Jason said, it starts. To, it's helpful to start by taking that campaign mindset. We want to build connections to content. Start building a relationship, really, and enriching people's experience. Uh, and one way I think about doing that is looking at how we can improve the experience on our current website, even apart from any sort of specific personalization campaign. How can we improve certain places on our website? Uh, Timothy Kolk, writing in Smashing Magazine, uh, talked about the idea of the fair trade. And he wrote that making fair trades with people builds trust with users, strengthens your brand, and is an effective long-term strategy to gain trust. Clearly show users the value you offer as a result of using their personal information. I think that idea of value is really important. Because uh, through a personalized experience, you really are trying to cultivate that relationship, like Jason talked about, those stealth, stealth, stealth students. Uh, we could build a relationship with them even before we've actually had an actual conversation. Uh, so one way I, I look at that is we look at the request information form. Uh, most of us have this kind of form on our websites. It's a place where we're really driving people to. We want them to get them in our database, send them view books, send them emails. But so many that we come across, I find, look like this, where they just are on this page. It's automatically just asking for your information, your personal information, your address, your phone number, your email address, without any sort of context, without knowing what, informa what information really means. Um, this is a, it's almost kind of rude, right? If I walked up to one of you and said, give me $10, you'd be like, no, <laughs> I am not giving you $10. This is basically the same thing. You're just going up to someone asking for money and not really explaining why. You came down the form, lots of information. They want to know what you want to study. It's all, give me, give me, give me. I want your information. Just give, it, give, 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 give it to me. But what am I going to get in return? So like, here's West Virginia University. And they say, tell us a little bit about yourself. We'll add you to our mailing list to receive admissions brochures, emails, event announcements, and deadline reminders. I know exactly what I'm signing up for. If that sounds interesting to me, great. I'm going to give you my information. If that's the information that I want, then I will give you my contact info in return. Outstanding. Then you have your form, and you fill it out, and it's great. Submit. Another good example from um, the professional studies program at the University of Washington Help us help you by filling out this form. You're giving us the info. We need to help you figure out what program is right for you. And they actually start by asking me about what I'm interested in studying, what kind of program I want to take, what do I want to know more about, and what, when do I want to get started. So before even making the ask for my contact information, they're really wanting to understand me and my, my needs and what I'm looking for. So they're really doing a great job of cultivating that relationship while gathering really valuable data. And then they start asking about what questions I have, what, how can we help you? And only then do they start asking about my information. How do I want to be contacted? Do I prefer email? Do I prefer phone? That's very kind of you to ask. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and then also say, asking me an uh, option to say, yes, I'd like to be added to your email list to be among the first to receive career tips, event invitations, and timely program updates. Uh, and also a little uh, disclaimer, if I submit my information, I could send to be contacted by phone, et cetera. So they've done a really good job in a crisp, I think, relatively crisp form experience of, make, of sorry, sorry to build that relationship with me, but also gathering some really, really valuable data. So this is a framework for thinking, we're thinking about, how, okay, so now how are we going to plan this content? Uh, there's lots of different information that we could provide to people, but what should it be? What is it actually doing? So uh, a guy named Colin Egan wrote a really great article about content strategy for personalized experiences in a list of part last year. And he posited this framework of different w ways of organizing content. There's sort of the task-oriented content, then the big picture stuff. And the task-oriented content is content that can alert me. Um, it's relevant, it's time sensitive. Then there's content that makes certain tasks easier. Then for the big picture content, it's the cross-sell. How can I market or promote relevant calls to action or information? And then there's the enrichment. It's extra bonus content that really en enhances my experience. 
I also think we talked about the importance of goals and really defining your goals. And this is a sort of an interesting, uh, I'm sure people have seen this Venn diagram before, this idea of, you know, you've got to hit the sweet spot between what your business needs are, what the user wants to do. But then there's, I think, some other considerations around sustain, what's sustainable for the organization, what's appropriate for the website. So you can be thinking about your, what you know about your user, that research, and what you're trying to do as a business, but you can't ignore these other two factors. This was sort of a, a modification to this created by a content strategist named Eileen Webb. Uh, and it, the idea of what's sustainable for you to create and manage and, and plan for, and what remains appropriate for the website is really, really critical. So the idea of sustainability, it, I think it's important to sort of identify what, what the level of effort is for different kinds of content. So if you're leveraging existing content, like just say, hey, I'm going to connect people to that request info form or whatever, that's low effort. Swapping messaging and imagery requires a little bit of writing, a little bit of photo selection, that's a medium effort. And if I'm introducing new content products and information like a, like a white paper download or a photo gallery or a video or something, that's a higher level. You bring that all together, you can really create a matrix whereby here are your different segments, so that could be paralegal or military or something like that. And then you're looking at the different types of content. This is alert, make easier, cross-sell, and rich. And here I could say this is low effort, medium effort, high effort. Do I have, oh, oh, I thought I had a laser pointer. I don't. That's just a random button. Um, so I can then say, okay, this is low effort, medium effort, high effort, and say, okay, so low effort would be just to, to point people to a contact us uh, form. Medium effort is a little bit of text about how to become a corporate partner. High effort is here's a case study on the benefits of forming a corporate partnership with our institution. So then you can look at this grid and say, well, what can we actually manage and what's going to work? Because um, you've talked about what type of content it is. You've organized that in some way. You've applied it to your different segments. Um, you've thought about the level of effort. Uh, and then you're thinking about the different kinds of content opportunities that you have. So this kind of a matrix can help you plan out the content for that effort. I find that micro frames are were kind of an interesting visual way to help organize this content. So you could say, oh, we're going to change, like we did uh, on that example, we're going to change the hero image to match the program, align the language with the persona, um, and, and, and do these different kinds of trades. And thinking about like, what parts of the website are we going to, of this page are we going to change? What parts will we leave alone? There are certain places, OK, we're going to have the same news feed. We're not going to change the news feed, for instance. But the hero image is an opportunity. So just finding a way to sort of look and figure out what areas are worth uh, investing in and, and changing that content and which areas you want to keep consistent. Then just think about the trigger points. Um, when you're developing a personalized experience, you want when, when you think about when is that going to activate? When will I know along the journey that okay, this is definitely someone who's interested in the military. This is definitely someone who's interested in paralegal. By defining those points, then you're going to have a, a clear sense of when you're going to start delivering that personalized experience, and it's going to feel more appropriate because you've thought about where they are in that journey. There's different presentation types. There's a lot of ways that you can do that. We showed some um, swap outs of text and imagery. You can have slide outs and pop ups. You can have um, information bars up here at the top of the page or elsewhere on the page. So think about the type of way that you want to introduce your information or your content. Uh, it could be an inline change. It could be something sort of introduce an element that sort of slides in or pops up. There's different ways that you can do that. It's important to think about those different modalities for delivering the personalized content. And always be testing. It's really, really important because it's easy to sort of create segments and throw stuff in them and see what happens. But seeing what actually works is harder. So you have to be prepared to be nimble uh, in this um, because you're sort of throwing something out there. And we're always testing to sort of see what's actually working. So testing the language, the messaging, the imagery. And then taking that information and looping it back to the content planning, saying, OK, this kind of messaging is working. People are really, when they are presented with that download, they really are downloading it. This is great. Or people are really downloading that. Maybe we need to create some sort of new enhanced content that will help be more helpful to them. And it's just a sense of sort of the publishing workflow. And this is a, a graphic that I often use to talk about the publishing workflow. And it really applies to thinking about personalized experiences too as well. We've got to plan and create. When you publish and promote, you have to measure and analyze and loop that right back into the content planning process. This isn't a one and done deal. It's a cycle of always testing and moving forward. Uh, also, style guides. Um, I think it's important to, number one, have sort of a foundational style guide for your institution, of course. Uh, but then you want the, the language and the content that you're introducing for your personalized experience to not deviate wildly from that. You still want it to be your voice. You want it to be the appropriate tone. Uh, you want to have, some, but you also want to think to the point of quick iteration. We might be making quick iterations here. So can we create some style guide that allows for quick response content creation to know, 
okay, we're actually going to talk to this audience this way instead of that way now, and have that documented in some way so you can, uh, so you can uh, ensure that all your efforts are uh, appropriate. The idea of consistency breeding trust is important, with that idea that you don't want this to be a deviating experience, you want it to feel organic. And through it feeling organic and authentic and not incongruous, that's going to help cultivate that relationship by cultivating that sense of trust. People will trust that since it's not super different, it's still what they're looking for. It's still relevant to them. And the other thing to consider is your privacy policy. Uh, this is sort of like the, the fine print, of course, but it's important that you're accounting for the fact of the type of experience that you're delivering. Uh, University of Oklahoma, I think, actually has a really well-written privacy policy that accommodates a lot of these concerns and things that you'd want to communicate to users uh, and have documented in some official way about how you might be using the website to deliver a personalized content experience. And with that, I think we're at time. We might have time for one question, maybe. Um, but that concludes our talk. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Wow, we were super clear. <laughs> awesome. All right, if we have any questions, uh, thank you again, guys. And remember, fill out your evaluation forms. Let them know how they did, okay?